Thank you. I'm going to introduce our host, who will introduce the rest of our panel here. Thank you so much for this important film, first of all. Let me just take a moment for that a round of applause. Harper Spiro is the host of the Made Visible podcast, among other things, which is a podcast that gives a voice to people with invisible illnesses. Um, Harper, want to take the stage? Hello, it's happy. I'm very happy to be here. I've been a fan of Real Abilities for a long time, so I'm very happy to be here. Tonight I have Enrico Bruzzese, who is the father of Julia, husband, respiratory therapist, and a cardiac diagnostic specialist, if you want to come join me up here. <laughs> Julia Bruzzese is a 19-year-old freshman college student, if you want to join me here. And Chris Hegedus is the producer of the film and has been directing, shooting, and editing for over 40 years. I'm honored to be here as the host of Made Visible. I've had Isaac on my podcast a few weeks ago, and executive producer Allie Hilfiger was also on my show, and she's a delight. I was hoping she was going to be able to be here tonight, but I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I'd love to start off the conversation. How did the, how did the creation of this film come to be? How did you decide to make this and bring it to life? Well, thank you for having us here. We're really honored to be at this festival. Um, well, the directors, uh, Lindsay and Winslow, um, apologize for not being here. They're actually in Milwaukee at another film festival. Um, both of them have chronic Lyme disease, and they met at a um, Lyme literate doctor. Um, basically, um, they were both at the same doctor, but didn't know each other. And uh, going through um, chronic Lyme symptoms, suffering a lot. And um, the nurse said to Lindsay that, you know, people recover faster if they have a passion. And Lindsay said, well, my passion is filmmaking. And the nurse said, well, actually, there's this other guy that was here earlier. He also is a filmmaker. Maybe you want to connect. And they did. And they decided to make this film. And um, I met them about a year or so after they started filming um, through some mutual friends. And I also had people in my family that suffered from chronic Lyme and was really interested to help them. They were first time filmmakers and pretty sick at the time and could really use some guidance and help. So that, that's how we began this process. And um, we filmed for another five years <laughs> after that. So it's, it's been a long road. Wow, and then how did Julia and Enrico get involved? Um, why don't you tell? Um, well, I was being treated at the same clinic as Winslow and Lindsay, um, and one, one, they approached my father, well, Win Winslow did, um, asking if we wanted to be a part of the film. And my dad, you know, he asked me one day, he's like, there's these filmmakers that want to make a film about Lyme disease, and they want you to be a part of it. And, you know, at that point, I was newly um, sick. I was newly in a wheelchair with this new disability. And, um, you know, I was kind of embarrassed of everything that was happening to me. I went from a very active member of, commu of my community to now, you know, wheelchair bound with a severe illness. Um, so I, I didn't want to really... <laughs> face people, and um, so when he asked me that, I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know if I want to expose myself in that way, and, um, you know, it took a few days to think about it. <laughs> I kept asking. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, finally I came to the conclusion, I, you know, once I realized what was happening and that I wasn't the only one going through this, um, I kind of came to the conclusion, and I think my dad did as well, and the rest of my family. Um, we have to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else, the, the, to the best of our abilities. Um, and this was my way of kind of shining a light on this really, really tremendous issue 
Um, and if that meant being in an uncomfortable situation and exposing deeply personal um, experiences I've had, if it's gonna help other people on their journey, um, that's all that matters, so. What did you each learn along the way? Um, you know, it was hard to ignore um, from the very beginning that we got stuck in a mess. We got the wrong disease and, um, you know, at every turn I was just really shocked about what I was seeing and what was happening to us. And, um, you know, in the film I, I said at a certain point I felt like I had to start recording. And for me, even though we were both, like, embarrassed, we nobody knew Julie was sick in our circle. We didn't tell our friends. Uh, our extended family, we were hiding all summer long because they were accusing her of being, of faking it, of being crazy. Um, but thinking about it and trying to convince Julia, I said, this is a way of recording everything. I mean, we need to get the word out and what better way to do it with this film? I mean, it was, um, and I think it's getting the word out, so. Uh, I think we we accomplished our goal. Julia, Chris, anything to add? Um, well, I always learn so much from making a film. I mean, it's a real privilege to kind of be dropped into the world of um, somebody else and let them share your life. And I'm really grateful to this whole family. More of them are here tonight, and they've supported this film so much. Um, but along the way, I've, I've just learned so much about this disease. And you know, when we show this film, there's usually you know several people who also have Lyme disease and and are really um, feel very seen by this story and them all the people sharing their stories. But um, I mean, also I've learned that almost everybody I talk to knows somebody that has chronic Lyme disease and that it's really prevalent and that just so much needs to be done. The tests are so faulty. And you know, I know that also the treatment is and doctors need to be educated. I mean, there's so much research and information that needs to go on with this disease. Just um, last fall, two people in my family were diagnosed um, with Lyme. They got Lyme disease. They went to a doctor, went to, went to one clinic and got the standard three week um, regimen of doxycycline, and the other went to a clinic and got one pill, and you know, which is kind of based on a faulty graduate student study that kind of traveled around the internet and doctors started using because, you know, obviously doctors, you know, nobody wants to overuse antibiotics, and I understand that, but at the same time, um, this disease is life threatening. And you know they'll give you a year's worth of antibiotics for having acne, <laughs> and you know so you know things are just really you know out of scale in terms of treating this disease and, uh, and really understanding what it is. So we're really hoping to get the word out um, to people to uh, pay attention to it and can go on our website, thequietepidemic.com, and share your story and find out information about what to do if you get bit by a tick. Julia, anything to add? Um, I think <laughs> what I've learned is that, I mean, Dr. Neil Spector asked a very good question, which is, um, the question isn't why me, but how do you move beyond that? Um, and I guess this was my way of learning how to move beyond it and try to use it for good. And, you know, I've, I've been to many screenings so far and the most satisfying and reassuring part of it for me is to see the people in the audiences who are asking really important questions. You know, um, they see what we are seeing and what we are experiencing, and you know, they're asking questions and they're becoming aware. And um, you know, I think that's the most important part. Um, yeah. I was sitting behind you during the whole screening and watching the two of you sort of interacting and looking at each other and just going like, how do you go through this? It's just so complicated and you're so lucky to have each other and to have the dad that you have, really. Uh, that's very clear, as you said, at your sweet 16. So um, 
while sitting there, is there anything that you observed new each time? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, they did a really good job about um, they did a really good job of informing people. Um, and there is so much information because you know this disease has been a long been a, been around for a long time. Um, and so much has happened, and you know, with the vaccine and the testing, and it's it it could be very you know complicated. And I think they put it in a way that was kind of easy to understand given the information. Um, so yeah, every time I've watched it, I kind of learned something new. I, I think it took me like four times <laughs> to get everything. <laughs> Enrico, in watching this and going through this process and these screenings. Have you seen the care for Julia change, you know, over the years since you started filming, since this came out? Yeah, no. Um, so if you mean through mainstream medicine, yeah, there, there is no, no change. We're, we're dealt with as much indifference as we were in 2015 than we are today. Uh, the key is to see the right doctor, and unfortunately those doctors... Um, don't accept insurance. Mm. It's very simple. Um, but they 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 know about Lyme and tick-borne disease, and they're all they also know about other common diseases that mainstream doctors would know about. So you need to go to a doctor if you want the right care, who has all the information. If you go to a doctor who doesn't because of insurance company policies. I mean, you're not going to get the right care. You know. So for each of you, I'm curious to hear what is the one takeaway that you want people to have in watching this film? What action do you want them to take? Um, well, I'd like just to get the film out to the public. We're going to be um, just releasing it on um, VOD, on Amazon, on Apple iTunes and some other platforms ourselves and um, we'd like to take it to um, medical schools and doctors and universities to show it and we have a campaign that we're kind of raising money to go out and do that as well as to go to Congress with it and bring awareness to con Congress and get more money from <coughs> the um, NIH to be put um, towards research and the money that's been given because they have increased some money recently for Lyme, you know, that it goes to new forward-thinking doctors, as kind of is said in the film. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I guess just, you know, pass this information on. I think that's what's really important is just to get the word out about Lyme disease and chronic Lyme. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to leave the best for last, but I agree with Chris. Uh, it's just spreading the word. If you have social media, put it out there. Uh, it's just getting as many people as possible to hear this and to be aware and to know the symptoms and knowledge is everything. Um, yeah, I mean, exactly what they said. Um, it's just about being aware and, you know, ticks don't discriminate. So literally anyone can get it. You know, it's in Brooklyn. It's in, it's in, in the city, it's on the subways. They're on the subways. We know people who've gotten bitten by ticks on the subway. Wow. Um, so it doesn't discriminate. They're everywhere. Um, and, you know, just be aware of the signs and symptoms. Be aware that the tests aren't re reliable. So if you test negative, that doesn't mean you don't have it. And, um, yeah, I just get, just know the basic misconceptions that were explained in the film. I think that's, you know, that's the the goal is just to inform. Yeah. And also the website, um, Chris said, right? There's a, a way of sending letters to your legislators and um, politicians. And that's the quietepidemic.com mm -hmm. in case right. anyone didn't get that. Yeah, um, I guess what, one thing to add is like, if you do get bit by a tick, uh, save the tick, you can send the tick in. There's various labs, you can find them on our website and a few other of the um, Lyme organizations' websites tell a lot of information, um, you know, because the tick will tell you exactly what it has in it. So it's a really good way to know. Um, also, um, 
on the websites. There are um, other labs, which unfortunately are expensive. You know, they're like some of them are up to a thousand dollars for a test. Um, if you're a senior citizen like me, you can get them covered by Medicare. <laughs> but um, you know, there's some that are cheaper. But they will give you a test that have those bands kept in them, so you'll get more of an accurate test if you have uh, if you're positive or negative for Lyme. Yeah, thank you. One other question before I open it up to the audience. So my podcast is made visible. Everything about it is about invisible illness. You name the, the film, The Quiet Epidemic. Where did the name come from? Quiet, invisible. It's just this really depressing thing that so many people are living with all these different conditions quietly and invisibly. So I'm curious where the name came from. I mean, I think it came from Mary Lee. <laughs> I mean, Mary Beth. Yeah, Mary um, Beth. Yeah. Mary Beth, you know, who says it at the end that it's a quiet epidemic, that um, people are struggling with it and it's not really known. Um, but I think it's getting more known. I mean, ticks are spreading, you know, because of climate change, because we've moved into their environments. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why we're c coming into contact with them. You know, because, I mean, I think a lot of older people here would say, well, you know, I never saw a tick, you know, when I grew up or whatever. And, um, you know, that's really true for all of us, but, or for most of us. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's changing now. We have to come to, you know, grips with that reality. Thank you. I'm going to open it up for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, he knows I've been, like, itching. <laughs> um, and all of you know, because I've told you privately how passionate I am about this film. Um, first, I want to start with something Itzy said at the beginning. I mean, the fact that we even have to discuss why a film like this would be at Real Abilities uh, really boils my, my blood, because I, I think what we're really dealing with is almost like an emperor's new clothes situation, except you're denying that there's any lime, right? It just doesn't exist if we decide it doesn't exist. and. I think I told you, um, so I'm on the Real Abilities Film Selection Committee and I watched this at like two o'clock in the morning, ended up staying up till four to finish it because I thought I would just like see the first five minutes, see if it's something that I wanted to watch later, ended up being so riveted, then realized that my friend produced it, thank you Chris, mm -hmm. um, of course, because I mean she's got the most I think your films are always about making a difference, whether it's for animals or for people. Um, so, but I, I wanted to say, and I had mentioned this the first time that I came to the screening and met all of you, that the pivotal moment for me is when they tell Julia that this is not medically necessary for her. And I know I've said this to you before, but um, cerebral palsy is actually technically, supposedly, the most expensive disability out there. And I am someone who would avoid doctors as much as possible. And about 2016, I decided I was going to get some PT. And after about two months, they issued me something that said it was not medically necessary for me to have any therapy. And it wasn't until I watched this film, and I think this is where it goes beyond Lyme, that probably anyone in, th in this festival that has a disability can relate to this, that Basically, I learned through this film that, that that phrase, it's not medically necessary, is just, it's too damn expensive, right? So I think that even if we don't have Lyme, the fact that some medical truth that is so obvious, and I'm so glad you filmed all of this, because this is a testament right here. This cannot be denied. So I'm getting to a question, I promise, yeah, okay. and here it is. <laughs> My question is, you obviously got some threatening, I would call them threatening calls from the CDC. And I know that the last time I saw you, you said you were going to testify in front of the New York Supreme Court. I would love to know what the reception to the film has been from the medical community. Have you been getting more threatening calls? And also, how did it go at the Supreme Court? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, no one, no one's reached out to us about the film or lashed out <laughs> to us only about with, the film. Only with positive feedback. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback, which is great. Um, and not in the medical community. <laughs> I know nobody, uh, nobody from the medical community that we know or deal with. Um, well, well. At, you know, it was it was screened at my brother's school at NYU. Oh yes. And yes. Um, 
you know, there was doctors there that and were hosting scientists, it. And scientists. Um, and scientists. Mainstream, you know, people from NYU. And they were very, I feel like... They came for my son, Adam, because they knew his sister was in the film. He's also in the film. He's sitting right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, they came for him, and they were really riled up by the film. And at the end, they were angry... How can this be allowed to go on? You know, that sort of thing. So thank you, Julia, <laughs> for reminding me of that. I forgot. Um, and the Supreme Court thing was because um, I was trying to get Julia care. Uh, that can show some benefit, but it's out of state. It's in Louisville, Kentucky. And our insurance company denied us. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I fought, and we got three denials. And then I had no other options, so I found out I could sue the state of New York um, with an Article 78, but I couldn't find an attorney who knew what an Article 78 was or one that would be willing to um, you know, take us on pro bono. So I did it by myself, and uh, I won. So now we're going <laughs> to go to Kentucky. Other questions? Yes, hi. I'm Lynn Bartner Wiesel. I lived in Connecticut. I'm also on the screening committee, and I help run the film festival. But I lived in Connecticut for um, 25 years, um, starting in, my gosh, <laughs> um, 1989, 1990. And um, I became a body worker, and I worked with holistic healing people and re regular medical practices and in chiropractor's offices, et cetera. Um, and I saw so much Lyme, um, so much chronic fatigue, so many people misdiagnosed, everything that you're saying. Um, but my question that I'm, I'm still unable to wrap my head around is that this bacteria, this spirochete, has so many different patents on one fucking bacteria. How is this possible, and how is it going to be possible to make any medicines because the cost, you have to pay every single company who owns a piece of this bacteria? How? are therapies being made and how can pharmaceutical companies learn from the researchers where's the money going and and what happened to those numbers on the test that the CDC took out where why is that test that does have the numbers thou it cost thousands of dollars i just i mean i've seen the movie a few times now, and I go back to these facts that you displayed, and I cannot wrap my head around it. How this can continue to cost so much, and, and what are these new therapies? How can they really exist with lack of real information because of all of these prohibitive things that have happened in the past? Yeah, I mean, thank you for that question. I mean, a lot of it, as you know, it's a for-profit healthcare system. And when you have that system, you know, it falls into all these type of things. And, you know, that that bacteria is patented by so many people. I mean, you're pointing out what a lot of this is about. It's all about money <laughs> is, you know, what that one researcher said. Um, it, it's, you know, it's what, you know, it all comes down to is that people wanted to profit off the making of a vaccine, and then they still wanted to profit off of it after it wasn't effective in 2000. So we've waited all this time with this faulty test, and they're putting out vaccines. I think there's three that I read that are coming out soon. Um, one of them I know has was in trials when we first released this film and Martha's Vineyard last summer <laughs> happened to be the weekend they arrived there with their testing truck trying to get people to be volunteers um, to take this test. I heard very little about it. It also supposedly went to the Hamptons and I didn't hear much about it there. So 
I, I don't know what's happening with that test, and the other two tests are slightly different kinds. Um, I'm not a biologist, so I can't really comment on them. But um, yeah, I mean, for-profit healthcare, we end up in things like you know, insurance companies only paying for 10-minute vi visits. I also just want to point out that even that test that you can get that includes those bands that is expensive is inaccurate. And there's more than one reason why the testing for Lyme is inaccurate. You know, it's an antibody test and it highly depends on a healthy immune system. The bacteria does not live, like to live in the blood. So, and there are other reasons. So even spending that money, there's, I forget what the percentage is, but it's not a reliable test. And that's just something to keep in mind. I just wanted to ask you as experts, um, well, how would you tell someone to avoid getting Lyme? What would you tell them to do? I mean, I would tell people to check their bodies. Of, of course, these ticks like going places I can no longer reach. So, <laughs> you know, you, you have to really pay attention to the symptoms and the signs. And just, I think knowledge is everything. But definitely body check and... and and, and you have to be careful, like, you know, know your surroundings, know the areas you're in, and, um, you know. Tick repellent. You could also treat your clothes yeah. with, there's certain repellents that are sold for your clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, because a lot of people don't even realize they were bitten. They don't, they don't develop a bullseye rash at all. Um, and that's why they get so sick, because they don't know they have it, and it festers for years until you know, they're fully disabled. And um, so I think it just be aware of the signs and symptoms of the disease clinically. Um, and if you see that you are getting symptoms and there was a chance you could have been bitten, um, you know, as you get treated as fast as possible. Um, yeah. We, we have a, we have a question. Sorry, sorry, we have a question. Yeah, but we can't, we, we have the microphone. Uh, um, yeah, uh, first off, yeah, if, uh, thank you for everything. I was, I, I feel bad how little I knew about th this actually here. Uh, um, but but I, yeah, my question is uh, for Julia. Uh, for Julia, um, you, you you know it's very it's very heartbreaking to just see you know at such a young age, you know you're dealing with, yeah, like you know doctors not believing you. You're you 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 know you talk about just how bad you felt when your father uh, left his job, wasn't making money, like th just this whole disability is evolving. Like, can can you talk just about how, like, what what was it that kind of kept you going and fighting and not get into that, um, you, you know, really like deep deep depression for, um, yeah, like all 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 these factors here at such a young age there. Um, thank you for your question. Um, you know, my my family definitely, and that I had people there to kind of advocate for me. You know, it was still very hard, and um, there were there were times where you know it felt very easy to give up and um, you know kind of like lose hope. And um, but no, it was definitely my family that was really carried me through it. And you know, I think back to that time, and like when I watched the movie, um, the things that were done in those hospitals. You know, I was a child. That could have been so damaging to me. Um, you know, and it has, it has damaged my trust in our medical society and, you know, just to be accused of those things, it, it's, you know, it is damaging, but it could have really gone s down such a, a, a hard road, a s such a dangerous road if I didn't have my family, because I know people who have been down that road, who have been put in mental institutions, and, um, Allie Hilfiger was one of them, and, um, so no, I just I, I I think I thank God every day that I had my family and um, yeah and you know years ago I couldn't imagine you know kind of trying to live a normal life and you know now I'm in my first year of college I'm just finishing up and um, so thank you <laughs> but I, I wouldn't have been able to get here without the support of my family and um, yeah. Folks, I want to 
we're out of time, but I want to thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you so much for moderating this beautiful conversation and for joining us for this important film. It's really um, a, a film that hopefully you'll spread the word about and really um, make sure that everybody in America make this film as contagious as uh, everything else out there. Um, Tomorrow, before our closing night, we have our beauty panel, The Future of Inclusive and Accessible Beauty. They'll be led by Sean Horn. Um, so please join us for that at 5 p.m. Um, and um, check out all of our films online and uh, join us for more. Thank you all so much.